So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, introduce you to James Valvo, who is with the Americans for Prosperity. He is the director of policy there, and uh, as you know, they have their Defending the uh, American Dream uh, Summit. Uh, in fact, we're heading down there tomorrow. Uh, the summit is uh, tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday. It's a great thing they do each year. Uh, James, I want to welcome you to the final ra uh, final <laughs> say radio show. You are on with Brett Rappaport and John Rappaport. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Excellent. Well, before we start talking policy, let's get into the nitty-gritty. What is Americans for Prosperity doing tomorrow, and uh, how could our uh, listeners uh, join in all the fun? Well, Americans for Prosperity Foundation is going to be holding our annual Defending the American Dream Summit. It's going to be August 2nd, 3rd, and 4th here in Washington, D.C. Um, this is our sixth annual, which is really a, a wonderful thing. I've been, I've been here for all of them, so it's sort of hard for me to believe that we're up to number six already. Um, but this is our uh, this is our big event of the year. Our activists come from all around the country to uh, to Washington. They do a good bit of sightseeing and getting to know the nation's capital. Uh, but they also come together and talk to a lot of the the big names that uh, are advocating for free market policies out in the country. So we have a great great uh, list of panelists that are going to be there, as well as the uh, main stage speakers. Uh, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker is going to be there, Bob McDonald from Virginia, uh, some elected representatives too, Ron Johnson, who's a, a senator from Wisconsin, will be there. Uh, we're also going to be having a, uh, a rally on Capitol Hill. Uh, Americans for Prosperity is going to be co-sponsoring that. And uh, that's going to be our rally to repeal the uh, health care law that everybody's been working so hard to, to overturn these last couple of years. Everybody's really frustrated when that went through, obviously, and there's been a lot of energy to repeal it. So when a bunch of activists are here in town, we like to take them up to Capitol Hill and make sure that the elected officials know that that's going on. We're going to have two great speakers at that, Paul Ryan as well as uh, Jim Jordan from Ohio. Those are two great uh, champions on Capitol Hill that have been working on the health care issue uh, ever since it came about. Oh, sure. I know I, I've been to, I think, at least the last three, and it could, this could be the fourth uh, in, oh, in a row. And uh, I, I don't know if it was last year or the year before uh, uh, Governor McDonald was the uh, one of the main speakers, and, and he was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, so I'm, I'm looking just, forward to hearing him. Yeah, he, he's fantastic. He's been to a couple of them. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that you've been to so many. They uh, yeah. continue to be, a, to be a big success, and our, our activists love them, and I'm glad to hear that you guys are going to be there. Well, I consider ourselves lucky here in New Jersey because we've got Steve Lonigan, who is so, you know, he's a great state coordinator, and he's been so active with all the conservative groups, the uh, Tea Party groups, the constitutional groups, and, and just Republicans in general. And he, he, he's, you know, he's got he's got a good message. He works very hard for Americans' prosperity and um, and espousing their message. And uh, he, he's great at organizing people coming down. So we're, we're definitely uh, enjoy the relationship that we have. And uh, I think you guys have done a very good job of, of getting the grassroots people active. Well, Steve Lonning is just fantastic. He's been with us for, for a really long time. There's, there was a, a group of states that sort of launched with Americans for Prosperity when it first came about, and New Jersey was one of those chapters, and Steve Lonning has been, been the head of that chapter all along. So it's, uh, he's been a real strong contributor and, and helped to make New Jersey one of our really strong chapters. So we're thrilled to have him. Sure. So now... Getting into the nitty-gritty of uh, his, uh, you're the director of policy. Uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes discussing some of the spending and 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 kind of the counterintuitive regulation issues that we have right sure. now, uh, coming coming out of such a, a a really deep recession, which you know, for all accounts, really could have almost become a depression. Uh, it seems to me that the policy decisions that we've made, um, you know, not just in the administration, but you know, often in Congress, haven't exactly been uh, <laughs> well leading us to the growth that we need going forward and yeah. over the last uh, three and a half, four years. Yeah, I, I couldn't. <clears throat> excuse me, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think the uh, United uh, Democratic control that that came about uh, a couple of years ago decided that they were going to make this a seminal moment in their. Um, administration of the country and that they really wanted to define Washington as the place that solutions were going to come from and the responses to the recession um, were all going to be ones that they picked and they were going to try and recraft and reshape this economy in their image and and we've seen time and time again around the world that that does not work right we know that in a country of 300 million people it's not possible for elected officials and bureaucrats in one city in Washington to make the decisions that are going to properly move your economy forward the types of investments that you need to see the responses to uh, market stimuli it's just 
not something that you can plan from from one centralized location. And they tried to do it with the stimulus bill. I think that was a real clear example of how they thought they were going to be able to uh, to pick and choose which types of jobs they were going to preserve, which types of jobs they were going to shield, if, uh, so that we couldn't go through the hard, admittedly incredibly hard process of creative destruction to to weed out some of the folks that weren't efficient anymore in the areas that they, that it didn't make sense to continue to spend money. They shielded a lot of those areas from that. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, I think the housing market is another place they they refuse to allow the housing market to to find equilibrium. We've had a, a massive overexpansion in the housing market, both from the government incentives to, uh, on lending for the encouraging banks to lend places, uh, perhaps that they shouldn't, as well as the mortgage interest deduction, which I think is a very popular uh, tax deduction that you know everybody who, who owns a home and is paying interest ha has access to that. Um, but it's really encouraged people to get into homes that they can't afford. Maybe not that they can't afford, but a little bit farther than they'd be able to reach otherwise. And that, and that has effects on, on the housing market. We really still haven't seen that market um, uh, bottom out and find its equilibrium. 95% uh, of all mortgages right now are owned or managed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the FHA. This is a completely nationalized sector of our economy. Um, you can obviously go to the whole health care discussion, too. I mean, this is one-sixth of the economy as well. All of those decisions are going to be made by HHS now, a massive expansion of the Medicare Medicaid program, which is the, the welfare medicine program for the poor. 15 million more Americans are going to get moved into that system that provides substandard care and, and reimburses doctors 55% on the dollar. I mean, these are the sorts of decisions that, that these folks made when they came into power, that they wanted to, to make all the decisions from Washington, and, and, and we couldn't disagree with them more. Well, see, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> couldn't have said it better myself. And, you know, just take the health care scenario, for, for instance. When that first started, as you pointed out earlier, we, it was complete democratic control of the government. Yeah. And the American people were screaming on top of their lungs you know, at, when uh, members of Congress went back to their districts. Meeting after meeting after meeting, the American people, I think it was roughly 65 70% were screaming, don't do this. Well, and that's and, why it remains a manifestly unpopular law to this day. I mean, we know that you can't yes. enact sweeping social reforms with only one party participating. This is the type of response you're going to get. And I and, and I give the same sort of warning message to the Republicans. Look, if you guys get control after this election, don't come out and do some sweeping thing that all the Democrats stand on the sidelines, even if you think it's the right way to go. This is a country where you have to bring the citizenry along, and you can't do something over the objections of that many people. And you're not going to have something as emotional and, and personal to people as their health care um, and, and change that entire system uh, whether or not you think it's for the good or the bad, you, you can't make that sort of a sweeping change and, and just leave a, a large segment of the population on the sidelines and say, we don't care about you, we're doing what we think is right anyways. You're going to you're gonna end up with an unpopular law, and that's where they're stuck. Well, that's absolutely right. And, it, you know, when we get on these issues, it seems to me uh, from just, you know, the last uh, God knows how many decades, actually, the pendulum slings from one complete side to the other, and then the, the people across the country get upset. They replace a party. You know, a couple cycles down the road, the same thing happens. You go back the other way. What this country really needs is, is, a, is a pretty, well, more, part, more bipartisanship, more clear long-term policy, maybe not on everything, but at least how about energy policy? Why can't we come together as two sides and come up with a, a good 20-year plan for energy policy so at least we could stop playing around with that? How about well, the, and, the and primary I'd add, responsibility? I'd add, I'm sorry, I had one say, more. how about the primary responsibility defense? Why can't we have a clear defense policy for 20 years? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> No, no, sorry, we were talking over each other a little bit there. And, I, and I'd add not, not just bipartisanship, but also something that, that removes the party labels, and that's why Americans for Prosperity is important. We're not out there trying to advocate for Democrats or for Republicans. We're out there advocating the policies that we think are important. And when we see Republicans stray from that message, which, let's be honest, more often than not, they come down on the free market side than, than the Democrats do, but, but certainly not always. There's a strong strain of cronyism and, cat, and uh, uh, corruption that runs through the Republican Party that sort of helps their corporate friends. And, and look, that's not markets. The strongest people in the markets are consumers, and we need to remember that. Uh, when we're advancing policies that are important to, to the free market community and we see folks that normally are our friends and normally are doing the sort of work that we, that we applaud – uh, violate those principles, it's important that we call them out. And so that's why even nonpartisan work, I think, is even more important than bipartisan work, although I'd certainly um, echo, echo what you said and, and reference back the point I made about healthcare earlier. Sure. You have to bring a broad swath of people with you. You can't do it just because, hey, you know, I've got the votes right now and we're going to do what we want to do. Sure, and I'll tell you, in, in New Jersey, for certain, that Americans for Prosperity has uh, targeted certain uh, Republican congressional members 
and said, listen, we don't like where you are on these policies, and this is why. And you didn't well, and I think Steve Lonigan's also been to the been, policy. Steve Lonigan's also a, a been a strong opponent of the governor and some of the sure. decisions that he's made. Even though the rest of the country yep. may think Chris Christie's a you know Republican conservative rock star, when when we've seen things that we think are, are bad policy choices, Steve hasn't been shy to criticize folks that uh, you would think, hey, we'd be defending no matter what. But that's not what we do. No, so I, I think you guys are, are very reasonable, and, and I would like to see uh, some of the other organizations follow the same suit. Uh, one other thing, James, is yeah, I think the media has played a very big role in a lot of the divisiveness between the two sides of political thought, or if you want to throw in a third or fourth smaller ones. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's time for the media to become more responsible and just get back to reporting facts and, and situations and issues instead of taking sides. Yeah, the, the the media certainly has has found their niche, and that's to amplify these differences and and to create conflict where sometimes conflict doesn't exist. Right? They don't want bipartisanship. They don't want nonpartisanship. They want bitter partisan fights that they can cover. And so that's why you see them sort of continue to shape different stories into those predetermined packages of, well, this guy's on this side and this guy's doing this for this reason. Um, instead of just getting back to reporting the facts, like you say, um, there's also sort of a false equivalency that tends to come out in the mainstream media, too, that they like to portray um, both sides as having, you know, a reasoned position and let's have these people talk it out when on something like federal spending, right, we've spent all this time talking about taxing the rich, taxing the 1% as though that's going to have any sort of impact on the deficit and runaway spending that we have in Washington. Our deficits are crippling this country right now. The amount of debt that we're issuing is just completely uncontrollable. The, the, the Fed has stepped in and has done two quantitative easings, although we've seen today they refuse to do a third, um, in order to keep those borrowing rates down, in order to facilitate Congress continuing to spend in this out-of-control manner. But what do we get in the mainstream media? All we talk about is raising taxes, and raising taxes is not going to solve this problem, even numerically. Forget the impact it would have on the economy and, and then the growth that it would stunt, but the actual numeric amount of money that you would raise from taxing comes nowhere close to resolving the spending problem, but they still want to talk about, you know, divisiveness, class differences, because it feeds into their narrative of confrontation, and that's what they like to talk about. Right. Well, I, I think it's a it's a great point. It's exactly what they're doing, and, and I think they're doing it for two reasons, right? The ratings uh, aspect is they're creating a political car crash, and everybody slows down to watch a car crash, although most people don't necessarily want to help. <laughs> And uh, and and this uh, this non uh, endless battle that doesn't necessarily help the nation but certainly helps ratings is something they seem to want to uh, perpetuate instead of just focusing, as Brett said, on uh, on providing truth and truth in the numbers. The the other uh, the other thing is it allows them to uh, to create a narrative which, in my case, uh, in my opinion, helps them to uh, place false blame. So as you pointed out, James, the num the actual numbers. If people looked at what the numbers would be, let's say that everybody bent to the of the uh, of, of the democratic uh, uh, political reasoning and tried to tax the rich numerically it would have virtually no meaningful impact and certainly no sustained impact you know I've heard numbers as little as like eight eight days of cure but what it does do is it gives somebody to blame and uh, if you have somebody else to blame then the then the president doesn't have to take responsibility and people need to hold both sides of the party they, they need to hold their feet to the fire yeah, I think that's right, and but I think we also have a responsibility to recognize that that's what's going on in our media environment and to tune out and to turn off and to seek out um, when it's important that we do that. And so, yeah, of course we know how you know MSNBC is going to cover stuff. We know how Rush Limbaugh and Fox News is going to cover stuff. The truth lies somewhere in between, right? And it's our our job to reach out and make sure that we're finding that information out for ourselves. And, and what's sort of an interesting dichotomy that's going on in media right now is the more volume of stuff there is out there, right? I mean, you could this is an amazing time. You can go on a computer and find out anything of all human knowledge by Googling. I mean, that's a stunning development in our society, the access to information that we have, the volume of information that's at our fingertips. But people do that less and less, right? They, they go and reach out only the places that tell them the story that they already want to hear so they don't have to reexamine what's going on. It's a really interesting phenomenon. I wanted to ask a quick think, question. Oh, sorry, John. <laughs> I, I wanted to get back to something that you had uh, mentioned earlier, and, and that's as far as the um, uh, when we're looking at the, the economy and uh, the improvements and, or lack of improvements, the um, the I don't know. I'm sorry. I had it. As far as the economy is going, the both parties have been playing this tax issue, and the 
$250,000 limit. If we were to look at that limit and, and, and uh, you know, if the, if the Republican side were to say, what if we move that up to $2 million or a $1 million or something where you're, you're not impacting the middle class as much or the small business owner, is, is that a middle ground that we could we could look to? But the question is, what what are you trying to do with the tax code? And I think that that's the the first question. We have to go back to sort of a first <laughs> principle. A whole what is monster. the role of the tax code in society? Is it to correct for perceived societal ills and inequity, or is it to raise money for the federal government and get out of the way so that folks can do their own activities in the economy after they've paid for the services that we need in any sort of public administration, right? Police, fire, national defense, court systems, uh, maintenance of public infrastructures. Let's find out uh, uh, the necessary safety safety net that we have to provide for certain members in society, right? Let's figure out what that volume is, find out the most efficient way to pay it, and stop trying to find these levels of, what, you know, where am I morally okay with us using the tax code to go after people who I think make too much money? It's, it's a really, to me, it's a little bit of a repugnant feeling, right? Oh, I'm going to decide that at this point you've made a certain enough money that it's okay for me to go after you and try and bring you down to the level of the rest of society. I don't think that's what the tax code is for. And not only that, but we've learned two things. One, it overcomplicates the process, uh, which which, uh, which causes uh, more more harm than good. Two is the history of micromanaging simply doesn't work. You know, we, we've we've tried it many times, and it doesn't work. They're always they're always behind the cycle, and they usually instead of letting the last problem cure itself, they create the next one. Well, right, and you're uh, just layering compliance costs on top, right? The, the folks in those upper brackets are the ones who are going to come and turn the, the code into Swiss cheese, which is what it is now. They're the people who are going to find ways to shelter and hide their income so that they're not paying the types of taxes that you would think just looking at the rate, you know, 36, 39.6% rate, you know, this is the amount they quote unquote should be paying. And, and the, the compliance costs that folks put into that is money that's not being put to an efficient economical use, right? Why should these people be paying all this money for lobbyists and lawyers and tax attorneys? and all this stuff to figure out how to, to comply with the tax code. I like the package that Paul Ryan came out with, two rates, 25 and 10. Really simple. I, 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 I tend to agree with you. Uh, James, we're up against a hard break, so before we, uh, before we take a pause, if you would kindly let people know uh, how they can learn more about uh, Americans for Prosperity, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, end the segment and uh, look forward to yeah. seeing you tomorrow. Sure, absolutely. I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. If folks want to learn more about Americans for Prosperity, they can go to Americans for Prosperity, all one word, dot org, and you can check out everything we're doing on there. All right. Keep up the good work, James. We'll see you tomorrow. Sure, thanks. thanks again for joining Bye -bye. us in the final say.